Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, your host today. I'm joined by Ernest Ralston, who's the CEO of Finexio. Ernest, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Craig. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad you're here as well. The title of today's podcast is Democratization of Anarchy and Payments. That's a mouthful. And just some background for that, the, the ongoing attack methods that we see, attacks on companies that target information, that target payment channels, has certainly scaled heavily over time. And this is due in large part due to the effective use of technology by criminals. And this includes the use of technology, including generative AI to help create deep fakes, more effective spoofing and compromising companies has been challenging both AP and treasury groups mightily uh, over the last you know four or five years. The criminal playbook is becoming enhanced with this technology. And this has resulted in the democratization of anarchy in the payment world. Ernest, I wanted to ask you: Have you have you uh, have you used ChatGPT for anything so far? You played with uh, some of the AI tools. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, we've been using ChatGPT at the company after using ChatGPT in some pretty fun and effective ways in our personal lives. So we've been pretty active users and you know passionate followers of technology. So. You know, we're leveraging here at the company, ChatGPT, around um, sprucing up our emails internally and externally. We're using it to generate uh, content as it relates to educating our partners and customers in the broader marketplace. We're starting to dabble with ChatGPT around data analysis. We're using other, um, you know, hardcore commercial tools around uh, AI you know, around data, but ChatGPT has been introducing some new capabilities there and we're using it as well to help us internally summarize our meetings and action items and look for trends uh, as well as for training. You know, as I think about ChatGPT, it's, it can do a better job than an intern much faster. It's more accurate. Now it still has problems. You still have to guide it with experts if you're trying to pull together some research but it's pretty fast and and pretty impressive. And certainly, like you said, the criminals are using it and using it quite effectively. And so maybe we can start, start there. How is AI bolstering the criminal playbook and toolkit? I know we mentioned in the beginning, deep fakes, the world of fraud, you know, you can even create code with these, these tools. What, what are, what are you seeing there from the criminal playbook? The thing that we're uh, paying attention to are ways that businesses looking to deliver payment could be fooled into sending payment information to the wrong place, which is often around uh, a criminal pretending to be someone they're not, right? And so that involves using technology to impersonate payees or suppliers in the business payment world. And that's around, typically that was around email and making the emails look like it's coming from someone that it's not and being uh, crafty around even the verbiage or the word choice to seem like you are that person. However, now with deep fake technology and AI, we have real concerns around using hyper-realistic but entirely fake audio and video content to do much more of the same in an even more convincing way to impersonate suppliers as it relates to to people. And that would reduce the bar even further around businesses sending money to the wrong place or agreeing to change, let's say, an email address or the really the worst culprit is changing that bank account because they think that they know and trust the person. And this technology is now and, and has been, in fact, for some time, uh, completely democratized and available to anybody. You know, you think back on some of the earlier attempts at spoofing, it was it was very horrible. It was English as a fifth language, typing with your elbows, and we all laughed. And then it got better, and they got people to do it, and it got better. And then the business email compromise improved and improved. 
But now you're saying, you know, the audio and the video, you think of a lot of the CEOs are on earnings calls. There's a lot of their voice out there, which can be spoofed. That is correct. We, we've gone on and um, I don't know that it's out living on the web yet. We, it will be soon. We've gone and created our own deep fakes of some of our executives to educate our team and show everyone how simple, quick and effective it is to create this. Just as we're starting to get the education and what's there and the, the kind of the stat that I think is important to share around why this really matters, and I'm sure we'll get more into that, is that 53, this is according to AFP, a pretty reputable organization around treasury and payment matters, 53% of companies are validating payments and payment security verbally. And that's what is really shooken us and having us so concerned around the use of other very prevalent commercially available technologies around identity verification and process verification to help protect against these new imminent threats in B2B payments. Do you remember if they, you know, if they had identified the different methods, whether it's verbally or otherwise, um, I assume that's all under the category of an out of band validation. Like if you get an email on it, there's, they're using a different channel like voice in that case or well that's just yeah no you're you're right on the out of band what you're talking about is a high level of sophistication craig not surprising given your knowledge and experience most of the businesses in the country still those middle market type clients certainly down to smb where we don't play but we have familiarity right, is what's driving the 40% plus of paper checks that remain and the 11 trillion or so of spend that that represents is with businesses that are not using any sophisticated processes at all around managing bank account information and payment information and are certainly not using software applications like Finexio or any of the ecosystem partners Finexio is integrated in that would, meaning using software tools whereby they would even realize, wait a minute, I'm getting a phone call. This doesn't sound right to me. I'm going to go and look at why isn't this through a process. Their process today is all phone and some scribbles on, you know, a post-it note that they have and hope it all works out. So we're partly educating around that, but even the, you know, using a vendor tool around a bank account validator may not be it. It's, it's really having a multi factor multi-form approach for combating and thinking through the if then then this type scenario just because the pace of the technology and the attack vectors is is um accelerating at such a rapid pace and this is only over the last you know year or so that this has really gone nuts and we haven't seen any problems within our customer base yet however the phishing and the spoofing and the attempts are we're only seeing and hearing and in the data sources we read that it's only increasing and we just know it's just a matter of time which is why we're leading a leading voice around um being ahead of this yeah that's a that's a good point it's it's supremely easy because it's available i mean that's why we talk about it as democratization now it's it's available to anyone the criminals don't have to be hyper sophisticated in terms of resources just using those tools it's basically free and can you do a few clicks and do you have a microphone that's the barrier now the cost of generating information has gone to zero with this wave of ai and uh you know all those thousands of monkeys at the typewriter creating shakespeare they've now right they've now bottled that it's instantly available and you've just got to be aware of it which is why sophisticated enterprise software solutions around payments are the way that most businesses will migrate to. And ones like, you know, our company at Finexio that are, you know, aggressively pursuing the state of the art in this area is, is, um, you know, I think what's going to bring the most solution to bear the fastest for the most companies. Well, I want to, I want to ask you about the layers of security and, and why that's why that's so important uh, or expand on that discussion, but, but using that term layers. But I was thinking when you talked about the video and you using some of your executives, I've wasted a little bit of time watching shorts from time to time, right? I yeah, yeah, yeah. They make sure. them addictive and, and you're watching. And there was this one that was, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, it seemed like 
the uh, telling very bad like dad jokes. It was you know. Oh, I uh, love a good. I love U- a good dad joke. U.S. presidents, you know, Biden, um, Trump, and uh, Obama. You know, they're telling all these jokes. It's them. It's all spoofed and AI driven. Yeah. But they're telling it. It's in their voice. The timing's there. You can't even tell. You can't even tell. Yeah. Uh, except they never crack up, which you know they'd have to crack up at some of the, the bad <laughs> jokes. But there's certainly a lot of, um, uh, of video footage of presidents. You know, even others, you know, you're on earnings call report or you're on uh, Squawk Box or whatever. There's there's your voice and there's video in different places where that could be captured. So whether it's just voice spoofing or video, there's plenty of opportunities to compromise uh, systems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they tell me it's they, they haven't been able to get one of me because my voice is just so high and nasally that the AI hasn't yet figured that out. But uh, going back to the. To the topic, I mean, one thing you can do to avoid a whole lot of this nonsense is leverage payment methods that are extremely secure. And there's just a lack of education broadly in the market on what that is. And so it's really about what methods you're using and how you're using them and why and where even the education level is there amongst your CFO, leadership team, and your bank. But the the payment method that we view here as most secure plus plus is the vir- is a virtual card, and and with virtual cards, right? You've got limits on the dollars of spend that you don't have with ACH and check. You've got randomly generated numbers that can't be reused. You've got no exposure to banking and routing information, and so. You're getting with this payment product a number of these, you know, going back to your question on layers, right? You're right. It's many different layers. Starting with the controls is like, let's talk about controls that are inherent within a product before you start going downstream to where humans are involved. Because humans, as we know, are are the weakest link in the chain. We can be fooled. We're, we're not robots. We're, we can be fooled. We can be tricked. We can uh, wake up uh, from a bad night's sleep and we're not paying as close attention that day. Um, so it's like, you know, things where check, you know, are more old school and paper and have inherent risk to some fraud. You can scratch out the number. You can you know, white out the name. There's a little, cra- all crazy things you can do with check fraud. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, maybe another podcast, we can go deep into all what all those things are. But um, with ACH, you make one small change to the account number or, you know, something very minor. It could be very quick. You call up somebody, pretend with the voice, what have you, and you could be out then a million dollars almost instantly. And the criminals are going and changing that bank account that same day or next day. And, you know, good luck. So that's where, and we can talk more about, um, based on what you want to get into, other things you can do and layer. But it, our view at Finexo, it really has to start with, are you using secure payment methods? And are you promoting those payment methods and really educating even the suppliers and the team and the accounts payable and finance department on why this is secure? Because payments aren't free. And that very cheap, you know, look, ACH is some banks give them away for free. You know, ACH costs 10 cents. There's no protection. It's it's very cheap for a reason. Virtual card is free to the sender, but the receiver of it is going to have to pay some several hundred basis points. But that's because the card networks are covering the fees and security there with, you know, their version of insurance with the banks are paying into. Um, and you've got all these control features that they continue to invest in around the protection. So it's really that that trade-off of what is really free versus not and what is the cost to the overall system. And um, that that's really what you have to think about there. Uh, something like, I don't know, 63% of companies last year experienced some type of check fraud. But the ACH fraud in terms of dollars dwarfed the check. So, so it's just, you know, there's no, you're not really safe anywhere, but certain electronic methods lend themselves to being more risky, which then require additional layers of checking. 
if you remember some quotes, you may have seen them, obviously. I don't think either of us were alive when he was there, but the, the bank robber, Willie Sutton, was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is, right? So <laughs> there's less less opportunity on the check front. It's, easy, it's the easiest to do checks, but there's less money there. So people have moved heavily onto the ACH side and wires and, you know, uh, any channel can be compromised to some extent, but like you're saying, there's there's different levels of security, different levels of cost, different levels of efficiency, and those have to be factored in. You know, as you think about the attack methods that criminals are using, as well as the channels that they're exploiting, what else would you say about how this matters to corporates, a uh, AP professional, a treasury professional, or a treasurer? Is it think first about how criminals attack and then the security of payment channels take them in together, you know, as different layers? How would you advise people to approach that? Yeah, well, I think I think part one is uh, it, it really matters a lot just starting there. I mean, this is based on our knowledge, what we're seeing, what we're reading why we've invested so much in anti-fraud prevention and identity verification and bank out verification is because it is very real and present danger. And so companies just have to care about this. And in fact, you know, when we talk to our corporate customers, they understand that the fraud is a um, just a cost of doing business around running the company, right? You're going to have some fraud just in accounts payable period. It's just, do they understand how big it could be? And when you're naturally larger and you're dealing at billions of dollars of spend, it's much more likely that you're going to have several of those six-figure losses and million-dollar losses that become a real black eye. I think, though, that companies largely think that the manual checks and balances, the double verification of let me hop on a... It's usually, right? It's like, okay, we'll check this and we'll have a person or team. We're going to have a manual review of all these things. The thought leadership coming out of Finexio with the democratization of all this anarchy that's available is that that manual step is no longer possible. That the hey, okay, you're going to get the email in about the change and I'm going to reconfirm your number, but now let me hop on the phone with you and confirm those details with you verbally. And I'm sure you've done that with a hundred banks uh, around your life or even with any company where you may have sensitive information, your health insurance, right? Your medical, something where you have to get on the phone and confirm some details or a password, you know, the whole your mother's maiden name or the address you grew up on as a little kid those kinds of checks with the voice and that becoming prevalent and instantly available, we're saying that no, you now, the people process of this is becoming less and less important. And the technology driven repeatable steps around this is more, if not equally important. And and those categories are around uh, identity verification using actual documents and the security features built into the IDs around validating that a person is real and who they say they are, leveraging where applicable biometrics. And I think we'll see that continue to to grow as a uh, replacement to dual factor, especially as the AI gets smarter and smarter. You can now have AI agents execute commands for you. And you said it at the beginning of the podcast, execute code. We're, we're almost there. Maybe we're a few months away from that, right? So Leveraging the biometrics, look at all the fantastic security work Apple has done around biometrics, both with the face and the fingerprint reading. And that's why they're now a leader in that area. And the the last is around cross-validating, right? It's confirming that the data provided digitally and validated for accuracy matches the data that's originally provided, layering in third-party services to also correspond to that. You know, we use something called account verification services, which is uh, brought to us by our partnership with JP Morgan is another third party bank channel to come in and add that extra layer. And, you know, that they happen to be the largest bank in the United States and the one or two bank in the world. So, but based on what measure you look at. So we think that the scale of that helps 
But as with anything, not one thing is going to be enough. And then that's where you go further downstream past that around using AI, which JP Morgan does, and by extension us, and other third-party tools we use around the anomalies in the transactions themselves, right? Whether that's free frequency, recency, transaction sizes, unexpected payees, and leveraging various government lists and do not pay lists at a state level, local level, in addition to the federal lists and global lists around, you know, that potential bad actors, which are changing on a, on a daily basis. So, so there's upstream and downstream things you can do. And our house view here is that it really has to be a mosaic around leveraging these tools in a smart way. And it's, it's not about, again, as you're, if you're a corporate, you don't have to be the AI, computer science expert. It's around, are we working with a partner that is leveraging these things in our benefit? And do we understand the basics of how it works? Or to the extent that you're a vendor and payment processing company, payment service provider, embedded service company, payments as a service company like Finexio is, are you, do you have an understanding around this as your culture and in your product strategy and fit that you've gone and integrated and embedded in best in class solutions and processes to create a seamless experience for these corporates that want to take advantage? That's the route that we've taken here. Yeah, that that sounds good. I want to, I want to spend a little bit more time on that, but before doing that, I wanted to have people get to know you a little bit more about what you do. Um, so uh, why don't you just describe uh, what you do at Finexio? Sure. Finexio is an accounts payable payments as a service company. So we help corporate customers transition to digital forms of payments, and we help them identify, deliver, support, protect, and enroll all of their electronic payments, helping them, again, get that transition typically from manual processes with paper checks into a safe and secure and seamless electronic payment environment. Great. And in the show notes, you can see uh, a link to their to their website. And uh, Ernest, what do you, what do you do at Finexio? My card probably says, you know, like chief bottle washer, or, you know, floor mopper. But I am uh, I'm the my day job is the founder and CEO. So my name's on the door. I'm responsible for everything. I am very much focused on uh, working to grow our business with very large partnership relationships we have with accounts payable and procurement software companies, as well as financial institutions that are looking to deliver a best-in-class embedded payment solution with the things I mentioned in my what does Finexio do comment inside their software package. So they're looking to basically increase the ROI and investment that their customers are getting out of very complex enterprise software around accounts payable, introducing payments as an extension of that, and ensuring that uh, our company is creating very delightful features and services around the shift and migration to electronic payments, which very much includes enhancements around fraud and safety and security, which post-pandemic has only accelerated in, in interest and um and prominence. So something, an area I'm passionate about keeping customers in our business safe and secure, but also um, helping everyone understand how payments can be profitable and uh, efficient and not scary. Yeah. So, so getting back to the, the discussion you talked about uh, the people component can be perhaps the greatest weakness in leveraging technology like ID verification, cross-validation, what other are there, are there other items that we should be thinking about here? I think you described them as a mosaic, like a bunch of different, I don't want to call it validation services. Yep, yep. Whether it's a mosaic or layers, any other layers or any other pieces that fit into the mosaic that we need to think about. And then I want to come back to the, the reason for the corporate treasurer and AP professional. This is kind of upstream from a Finexio, but having a really good formal vendor onboarding sort of KYC type process, we don't even see that existing. 
most of the time with a lot of businesses as well. As we go and work with many more is over the last few years, we've done enterprise customers and work with some of these very large, as I mentioned, enterprise software companies. They're providing those services or doing that, but that's a component for sure. You've got identity verification. You've got bank account validation and verification. Typically, there's a variety of tools that you need to use for that because there's different types of businesses or entities and accounts that need to be verified, whether that's a consumer, let's say that it may, right? It's a, it's a small B business because, uh, say you're a university trying to pay a vendor, but that vendor is a visiting professor who's just a guy with an LLC and he needs to be paid $5,000 for that one day lecture he gave at the university. He's going to have a different, different profile as well as sophistication than, right? Paying, again, to use an example, Apple corporation that you've bought all your computers from for the university, right? So just a different level there. That's a component to, um, again, f- using third-party databases and data sets. We actually, I referenced uh, account verification services. We're actually using a number of third-party tools and services around uh, identifying and validating what a business is. Another you know, large, well-known company I might reference would be like a LexisNexis as well. We're leveraging and appending data from another major player, Zoom Info, to help correspond and match that. So it's it's a number of steps that you have to do across the whole board up front. And what information do I have? Is it clean? Is it good? Do I know what it is? Is it stored someplace safely and securely? Is it encrypted? The relevant information around PII or account info, is that encrypted someplace? Can anybody access it? Can Gene and the accounts payable department just stumble upon it? Or if Gene decides he's going to be a bad actor, can he go in and just make the change and there's no audit trail? So that's another component. It is a system where you can track who changed what, when, and how. And then applying all these tools and having software and technology to match that against what was previously entered, again, with the audit trail and letting every know everyone know what happened and that they're good to go. That is a... Um, Kind of a bit more of a process overview, as well as some of the steps of where the technology would interact and, you know, absent using technology, that's where you have a person that you just have to trust that they're doing some of that and um, are completely perfect 100% of the time. And I, I think the unfair reality is around the treasury department and within accounts payable is very few organizations that I've seen in my 15 plus year, you know, B2B payments, accounts payable career, um, which I didn't mention earlier, but I've been in this space for most of my career. Back office stuff can be fun and sexy if you make it. Is that these folks have pretty demanding, complex jobs with a lot of moving pieces where the payment delivery or bank account piece, where the fraud vector is happening, right? It's around that change. That's just one small component of, right? They've got to get vendors in the system. They've got to get invoices in. They've got to approve those invoices. They've got to validate all that. They've got to manage it all for routing. Maybe they've got some complex coding and accounting they need to do. There's this three-way match process. So it's just the overwhelming scale of growth in an expanding business environment with a very tight, with very tight over the last few years until today, labor market conditions where CFOs, finance folks, treasurers are being asked to do more with less. While the risk is increasing, the technology is expanding. And if you're still doing this manually, you're just asking for a very bad day, right? A very bad weekend that's going to be coming up at some undisclosed date in the future when you realize you have a problem or you discover that problem that has been occurring for months right under your nose. But because everything was on scraps of paper and an Excel spreadsheet on someone's hard drive, you just couldn't identify. And this isn't even assuming there's a bad actor in your shop, which is what's really scary. Someone gains control of credentials. You know, Ernest, when you were, you mentioned a few things like some organizations spending more time on the vendor setup and onboarding process. You know, we've seen that that level of care go way up, particularly with banks and then insurance companies and a few other types of industries. But that level of effort is not something that most firms can do. The overhead's just too, too much. And so I wanted to just hear just, you know, you comment briefly on 
how does the the wide range of companies achieve those benefits? And this is not a an opportunity for a sales pitch, of course, but the democratization of anarchy and payments is an issue that matters to corporates like uh, accounts payable professionals, treasurers. What's the big risk if they don't do it? Or what are the risks if they don't do it? I know there's losses. How would you position that as a as a reasoned warning considering the ongoing increased threat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Risk number one is significant financial loss. You've got serious reputational risk and harm to the extent that critical supply chain vendors and suppliers, and I'll take a step back, you know, there's an 80-20 rule in accounts payable where 80% of your spend is going to go to 20% of your suppliers. The bad guys know this and are targeting the highest volume type ones as well and are typically monitoring folks and looking for an entry point around the email. So they're usually waiting and watching. You're missing now. You've got a you got a problem. You've got a fraud. You got a breach. You've got an issue. Now you're at a million dollars. You got to scramble to figure out what's going on. Meanwhile, payments that aren't being rendered for services being delivered. Now you're having stoppage of service. Right now you're having electricity shut off. Now you're having phone shut off. Now you're having uh, your trucks shut down. Critical vendors not being paid. Now all your customers hate you. Now you've got bigger explaining to do as well. So that gets into the reputational component, but it's a critical business function shutdown around these areas combined with, again, not stopping people from getting into your systems. They could shut down the whole finance department, hold your accounts hostage, needing you to have to open a Bitcoin wallet someplace to send these guys money to unlock your stuff, right? We've seen that happen a number of times, going to cold storage to try to unlock access to your accounts. Um, And we've seen one, I won't mention any names, but we've seen one major accounts payable software company, uh, I think twice in the last 18 months, get hit with data breaches around this. So back to your point on, uh, you know, I rob banks because that's where the money is. These folks are not dumb. They're smarter than us. And we're just trying to hear bang the drum and say, look, this technology is is going nuts right now. It's available to anybody there. It's smarter than again, that back office worker that they're just not trained and ready for this yet. And they're not dumb. They're not smart. They're not bad people, highly motivated, but they don't have the tools to combat it is the thing. Excellent point. Well, Ernest, as we as we wrap up, I want to give you a chance for any final thoughts. It could be a reemphasis of a point or it could be uh, something new. What What would you want to leave the audience with? The key point here is that this technology around artificial intelligence, generative AI, uh, deep fakes, uh, video generation technology is here. It's real. It's only going to accelerate, as is electronic payments. That's very real. That's only increasing in interest and attention and is, in fact, in high demand by suppliers and payees and businesses and CFOs are looking to take advantage of this. But how can you deliver all this safely, securely, and very profitably? Our view is that leveraging the safest and most secure digital payment methods like card, virtual card, is powerful and compelling and should be leveraged with organizations like Finexio that can help guide the way there. But that's not a panacea because that payment method won't work for everybody. And even though new payment methods are coming out, You got still got to support all the old ones and the old ones have fraud. The old ones have problems and the criminals know that and they will attack the weakest link because that's where if you want to get through the fence, you would go and attack. So you've got you've got to have a comprehensive strategy around this. And I think partners on technology and thought leadership to help you think through how to do that in a safe, secure and easy way while servicing the needs of customers and vendors, right? That are also pulling it, pulling at these businesses saying, hey, hey, we want to get paid faster. We want to get paid cheaper. The checks are costing us time and money too. I've got George over here is manually going to the bank every week to go deposit these checks. We don't want to be doing that. We want to be paid electronically, right? We want to improve our cash flow. I like it. Attacking the weakest link or every link that's weak where there can be a fruitful theft. Um yeah, it's a big issue. Thank you so much, Ernest, for uh, for your time today on the Treasury Update podcast. 
Thanks for having me. Really fun conversation. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.